Welcome to Band Splainer, the podcast where we explain bands. I'm Olivia Ladd, a music journalist in Nashville, and I'm really curious about retro bands and bands with cult followings and the history behind their music. Every time I'm out with friends, we end up talking about bands that we love, sharing personal anecdotes and facts, and talking about why we like their music so much. So I decided to record these conversations and create a space where we can go in depth and share with other people who love music. On this show, I pick a band with a cult following and have a guest from the music scene here in Nashville hop on, and we delve into the history surrounding that band. We go into their discography and kind of beyond what you would find on Wikipedia to give context about not only the music, but also the art, politics, influences, and different forms of media surrounding these artists, in turn giving you a better understanding about their art. I hope this podcast helps someone find their new favorite band or helps someone learn something new about a band they've always loved. So thanks for listening. Hey everybody and welcome to Band Splainer, the podcast where we explain bands. And today we're going to go beyond whip it and tell you everything you've ever wanted to know about Devo. Um, which is a really interesting band that has somehow maintained a cult following into the year 2018. Um, And so I have my friend Todd Campbell here to talk about Devo. You can go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, uh, my name is Todd Campbell. I'm just a dude that really enjoys music. So Devo is a band that started in the early 70s with Mark Mothersbaugh and Gerald Casali, and then their two brothers, who are both named Bob, and their drummer friend, Alan Myers. Um, So Mark and Gerald went to Kent State University together, and they were art majors, and what, like made them want to start this band is that they were present during the Kent State shooting. Um, that's May 4, 1970. Um, so this is a time of like big like political uproar um, and a lot of like reaction from like the Kennedy administration going on. Vietnam War. And yeah, the Vietnam War, yeah, this like protest um, going on on college campuses, which is what happened here. So after this happened, they got the idea of de-evolution, um, which is what Devo is named after. Um, so they had their first performance in 1973 at the Kent State Performing Arts Festival. Um, and this was filmed along with some other things, um, and it became The Complete Truth About Devolution, which is a film uh, that they ended up producing. Um, yeah, it's uh, super strange. It is. It can be found in its entirety on YouTube. Uh, it's about 10 minutes. Uh, what is that? Maybe... Six of that is music, and the rest is just weird yeah. scenes. So it's really interesting, and it ended up years later winning a prize at like the Ann Arbor Film Festival. Um, so it's definitely, I think this part here is kind of how Mark Mothersbaugh always like has considered himself an artist over a musician, and especially when you look at the early stuff like this film, you really can tell it's super weird and something like only Devo would do. Um, but because they won that award at Ann Arbor Film Festival, uh, David Bowie, like, caught wind of them, um, which kind of jump-started their career, um... Yeah, it was a demo got sent to Bowie and Iggy Pop from, um, a guy in another band in Akron, I forget the name of that band, um, but he sent them, after that film festival, he sent them, uh, demos, and so they... We're like super into it, both of them, right? And so they were both there for Devo's first show in New York at, if I'm not mistaken, Max's Kansas City. Yeah, yeah, that David Bowie uh, put together for them. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of their first big show, too, because they were literally this like art college band that David yeah. Bowie found. Um, and even so, by like um, 
By the time they were working on their first record, they had gotten down, like, their lineup, which was, like, the five original guys, and they had gotten their instrument lineup, which is kind of a more organic sound toward the beginning, um, but their first stuff, uh, so their drummer, Alan Myers, literally used homemade electronic drums, like, he, uh, very much like musicians today do like had all these pedal boards and like synths and all these things and just kind of made his own like uh drum kit and that's kind of how they did all their music was very diy in a basement um and so i think it's also worth noting uh devo was like so ahead of their time like in the early 70s that people like didn't get them they like they thought it was it. a joke or that it was yeah. ironic um and now it's kind of crazy because they're making better music or they made better music then than like people you know people are still trying to get to that caliber i think like some yeah. people well, um, it's really smart it's witty right yeah um and it it's not direct it's very indirect and like kind of hard to to grip Lots of, like, double entendres, and you're like, do they mean it this way? Do they mean it that way? Um, And it's, like, it's funny um, in... There's, like, a live... A few live kind of, uh, I guess, DVDs or, like, live performances available digitally. And in one of them, they were playing a show in 1975 at, like, a club, and the promoter, like, went behind them and just, like, unplugged all their instruments because he thought they weren't taking it seriously and was, like you know, get off the stage, and, like, I don't know, that's just how advanced Devo was, like, it was, like, an art project, and people, people didn't like, get didn't get it. Um, uh, Mark, Mark, Mother's Boss set, has said that early, those early shows, they probably got paid more often to leave than they did to finish yeah. their set. So. Uh, I think that's really funny. I feel like if it's you're... It's punk rock as fuck. It is punk rock. If you're <laughs> pissing people off because they don't get your art, because they think it's too weird, you're probably doing something right. If people yeah. think you're too weird and, like, don't want you there, then you're probably making good art, and you're, like, pushing boundaries, <laughs> which is what they did. Um... Yeah, and so around the time that the film came out, also, uh, which you said you watched, actually, uh, Neil Young found this band via David Bowie, and he wanted them to write their own part and do part of the soundtrack for his film Human Highway. Um, yeah, it's it's like a post-apocalyptic film that essentially occurs because uh, we're mishandling nuclear waste and uh, things of that nature and it, it it's not great but they're okay so neil young sings a song with devo in this movie and it's like a uh it's what is it it's like a like kind of a old like folk song right um and it's that whole scene is like really cool uh, but they're like garbage men yeah, they're nuclear garbage men yeah. in the movie. And uh, in a way, I, I think that's kind of what they were already going for. But in their, like, early performances, they're wearing, like, the yellow, like, nucleo reactor attendant suits and, yeah. like, red hats. and Boogie like boy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which is another thing. Uh, I guess we can go into that later. But they have, like, a host of characters and fake bands um, and all their music videos. But the first one is... Uh, bo- boogie boy, boogie boy, um, and that's like the when you think of Devo, like the yellow suits, the red hats, like mechanical movements, like that was that character uh, in their music videos for like I can't get no satisfaction and yeah, uh, so all their first a, hits. He's a a mutant <sighs> infant human, I guess, like adult infant adult. Uh, talks in like really high pitched voice and um he's just around all the time until i guess around new traditionalists really um he's pretty much always around <laughs> yeah i think yeah i think that's the longest standing character um uh they named which, their record company. yeah yeah so they named their record company after this character and released their first like official release was like a seven inch um, and it was Mongoloid and Jocko Homo. Um, and these are songs that you'll later find on their, like, unreleased demos mm-hmm. that got released in the early 90s. Um, but they are the two songs from their early days that made it onto their first album. Um, so in 1978, 
they were signed to Warner Music Group, um, and they, like, moved out to L.A., and um, a cool thing here is there's a video that Mark Mothersbaugh made once, and um, he said that they were inspired by, like, walking on Madison Avenue and seeing how, like, people were buying stuff they didn't need, eating food they didn't want, and, like, spending money on all these things and, like, just consuming products mindlessly because of advertising, and he was like, we wanted to take that societal approach, but to our art that's anti-society. And uh, yeah, it's... so it's kind of crazy because they're signed to Warner, like the third largest label uh, on earth. And they're <laughs> this weird art rock band, like trying to push a message of like de-evolution. Like... And it's because of David Bowie and Iggy Pop. I mean, like, yeah, it, it, specifically the, the their their record got done on Warner Brothers specifically because of Iggy Pop. Like, uh he was kind of the one that sat down in the meeting and, like, made it happen, right? And so there's... There was supposed to be, like, a Devo documentary that got crowdsourced a long time ago. It never got made. Yeah. But there are clips of it that are out there. Um, and in one of them, uh, Jerry Castle says that uh, when they first talked to the people at Warner Brothers, right? And so... Um, the guy was like, you know, I'm a big record guy. I can make anything happen. And uh, so they said they wanted to play Saturday Night Live. And that's how that happened, is Warner Brothers made that happen. Yeah, they played SNL a week after the Rolling Stones, and they played I Can't Get No Satisfaction. And yeah. uh, that's really punk rock. That's, like, <laughs> so cool. Um, and so, like, David Bowie was supposed to produce their first album, too, and then he realized he was too busy, which I imagine he was. He, he was has a lot shooting, going on. He was shooting Just, uh, just a Gigolo. Okay. The movie, the interesting movie. Yeah. Um, and so actually, Brian Eno produced it instead, which I think the is world so renowned. cool uh, because they befriended Brian Eno and like he influenced their music. I assume they influenced him um, because I I would I would consider him new wave, um, like some of his stuff new wave or um, like kraut rock. Yeah, and exactly. Stuff. And so it's kind of this whole proto punk sound that's kind of like rejecting the psychedelic. Uh, sound kind of thing and like yeah I've sourced in like kraut rock and like kind of jazz and ambient uh, industrial things yeah um, and I, like I a, think that's cool it was like a really supposedly both Eno and like Mark and Jerry have mentioned that it was not pleasant working together uh, because at the time like Eno was really kind of making a lot of weird noises <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> making a lot of weird noises. That's, I mean, that's what he yeah. was doing, right? Yeah. Uh, his music was a bunch of weird noises. And um, he like created all these sounds for their album, but um, they were really hesitant to take all of that stuff from him. Uh, so it, a lot of those sounds that he made really only made it onto like two or three songs on, on the album. But, you know, the big thing is, like, he produced it. So it's, like, yeah. got all of that signature, like, crispness that Eno, Eno production has. Um, but, yeah, it's they, they supposedly did not enjoy working together. And it's kind of like, that seems to be a, a reoccurring thing with Devo and all of their producers. They never work with I the same imagine. producer more than once. Yeah. Um, uh, which I guess there's something to be said about being, like, stubborn about what you want and, like, your art, but also later in their career, maybe they should have listened to someone. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, they, maybe they could have they uh, taken some advice. Have, yeah. um, but I do think it's really important for artists to be able to collaborate, so yeah. that may be an issue, because um, they did have cycling members in and out, like, as most bands have been together for a while do. Um, but so, uh, their first album, Q, or Question, or We Not Men, Answer, We Are Devo, is, like, my favorite Devo album. I think it's a lot of people's favorite Devo <laughs> yeah, album. Easily. I think it's just the purest, uh, form of Devo. And I remember, like, the first time I heard this, um, was on vinyl, so I got, like, a really pure experience. I, like, had heard Whip It and a couple other songs, and I was, like... I don't really know anything about Devo. I honestly thought they were some like weird one hit wonder or something. Yeah. And then when I started getting into all the music I like, I was like, okay, I think I need to like give this band a chance. And it was like 
It was, like, awe-consuming to hear it. It was, like, so life-changing to hear this record. It is. Um, and I think it hearing is. it on vinyl was cool because I really feel like this record has a strong A-side, B-side, and that the A-side, you start with, like, Uncontrollable Urge, Can't Get No Satisfaction and all that, um, all the way up to, like, Space Junk and Mongoloid. And it has this kind of, like... Um, I don't know the word, kind of like a build-up kind of thing, like rhythmically, and then it just goes into this super weird, like, uh, spiraling, like, explosion of sound, like, um, and I think, like, gut feeling, slap your mammy and mommy, um, is, like, a really oh, good dude. example of that, because it just so kind of, like, comes to a head, and, like, it's, it's, like, a wider range of noise, um, uh, it's such a good record, it's, it's so good. So, I, you know, like, my primary genre, I guess, is punk and all its offshoots, is what I listen to primarily. And so, in the early ages of the internet, young Todd is scrolling <laughs> through punk rock forums, uh, right? And so, somebody mentioned this album. And I, too, had that same kind of like, what? Because uh, at that point in time in my life, my only association to Devo was Whip It through, like, pop-up video on VH1. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'd and, seen the music video, but I, I, like, that's all I knew. And I was like, yeah. what is this weird, like, I thought there was some, like, kind of industry plant thing. I was like, that's not real. And then I realized, like, art. Yeah, okay. it's so like, different, right? It's like, it and is its own thing. And, like, honestly, after, you know, somebody in a punk rock forum saying, hey, this is an essential album that you need to listen to, uh... I quickly began to feel the same way. It is easily um, their most Devo yeah, album, it's right? So, I mean, it's it is. So it is what it's they a, wanted to be. Yeah, uh, it's really wonderful. It's um, and it, it's like this is where you begin to see too, like, okay, we're going to take this instrument, this synthesizer that is not used in anything besides, like, prog rock. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, Rush and things like yeah. that. Uh, yes. Uh, and we're going to flip it on its head and, like, put together this insane statement. I mean, like, after the Kent State shootings, Jerry Castle says that it, it's, it made him snap. Yeah. And, like, you know, it's... 1970 there's all these hippies around and after that happened like Kent State shut down for a semester the rest of the semester they go back to school and it was like nothing happened yeah and that bothered them right and so you know we're we're always taught about this like oh uh, this human evolution thing but they didn't really see any empirical evidence of that right yeah it's like everybody was becoming less smart which uh, is really relevant today. Like yeah, you oh, absolutely. literally like there's shootings at like places and then two weeks later there's no news about it. I um, mean they were they were angry. This, this yeah. they were angry, but they didn't they didn't fit in with other punk bands at the time because they knew what they were angry about, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um and I think that's a big that's a big thing with proto punk and that's why I think I mean that's like my favorite genre, like half yeah. the podcasts we've done are about bands that come out of this era. Um, because, like, punk rock is this, like, direct, just almost reaction to the free love movement kind of thing, and it's almost, like, not necessarily based in conservatism, but it's kind of, it's just kind of anti all of this stuff, and it's, a, uh, it's just, like, an angry, it's, like, childish, it's, uh, like, in a good Working way, though. Working class, man. Yeah, and it's, it's very, like, average person, and proto-punk is, like, um... It, it's art rock, it's, uh, it's, like, people with a message and, like, a like a reason and all of these things and so they're doing punk and to me it's just like such like a smarter way you have like television patty smith and they're writing protest music um and television it's like coded character. in poetry and like um these new sounds that are kind of anti-punk and anti like psychedelic rock um and you get into electronic and just it's it's very much like a new territory i think this album is just like such a landmark of all of that time because i think like the best music is like 1977 to like early 80s like uh there's just so many great albums that came out then and i think yeah. this is like one of the first ones that like really set the record straight for like what this genre is going to be whether like inadvertently or on purpose like uh this record has come to like kind of mark the beginning of an era i think it's also um, great album art great yeah album art. it is it's one of it's... the last times <laughs> last times albums were made that didn't have to have a, a 
barcode, a universal product code plastered on them, oh, right? Wow. So uh, this this album's artwork is really like neat. There's a cool story behind it. So Chichi Martinez was like a really famous golfer. Uh, and he had like a line of bags and you know golf shirts and stuff and all the tags had his face on them and this the image on front of this is the guy on the golf ball right that's was supposed to be an Im the image from that tag of Chichi Martinez but Warner Brothers was like uh no <laughs> I think we're gonna get sued so they, they ended up getting permission from him anyway uh, but they had already went ahead and, and ran the new version. And the new version is like a face meld of like Ronald Reagan, JFK, oh, wow. I didn't and know like that. another That's random crazy. guy that they found. Yeah. So it's an amalgamation of a bunch of different faces wow. mashed in with Chichi Martinez, which, if you think about it, is kind of like the essential Devo thing anyway. It's the most Devo yeah, thing. Yeah, that anyway. really is such Just crazy. Just like a mashup of um, all these weird consumerist and like, yeah, conservative and like, ideals. And I think people like thought they were maybe like being ironic doing stuff like that, but they weren't. Like that's like authentic for them. Yeah, yeah. that's absolutely. That's really cool. Devo. I didn't know that. Um, it is a great album cover. I've always thought it was just super weird. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, after this, they're still with Warner, and uh, so they released Duty Now for the Future in 1979, um, and I it didn't get much like commercial success. I love um, this album. But it is a good album. It's a lot better than like their later stuff to me. Um, and it's still also, so in their first one, they really set the precedent for like the themes they explore throughout their whole career. Um, and so it's these very like spacey sounds like, um, yeah, I mean like Jack Ohoma on the first album is essentially the explanation of yeah, the band. Yeah, and, exactly. That's like, and it um, sets the precedent for everything they did after that. Yeah. And, uh, so also I feel that, uh, by beginning doing this like electronic music while still being like anti-corporate and all this stuff, Devo is one of the first bands to exist like in a digital space. Devo is like with these music videos and things, they're some of the first people putting out these super like digitally influenced music videos and oh, yeah. uh, super new for the time. And they curated this image like in a digital space as well as in real life. Um, it's a whole performance and, art. Yeah, yeah, right. it was performance art. And um, so I think it's cool that they like used new medium um, kind of that was like not widely accepted. It ended up working out for them. Duty Now for the Future has a lot of kind of this like theme and I think it's a really good build up to their next album. Yeah, it's definitely um, middle. It's you can see them just the transition. making a transition, yeah. right? It's not it's still not like fleshed out at all in this album. Again, on their like, you know, trading out producers for albums. This album was produced by Ken Scott. And Ken Scott is the most notably known for being the co-producer with Bowie on Ziggy Stardust. And so he probably got this job producing this album because he knew Bowie and he did Ziggy Stardust and its follow-up. Um, and Warner Brothers was like, yeah, that's going to be a thing, right? But Castle hate Jerry hates this. Like, he loves all the songs on this, but he hates the production on it. Um, he's been said that he said that this is where they lost their balls. Uh, or he they got deballed by Ken Scott. So, so to speak, but like it's still very guitar driven. Yeah, and that's um not until their next album did they go almost fully electronic, minus just Mark Mothersbaugh's guitar. Yeah. So this one they still have multiple like organic instruments on it. Um, so it's a very interesting sound. And this is this is the one that like I mentioned previously didn't have to have a UPC code on it, right? So this was early in the universal product codes lifespan when this album came out and so they had to put barcodes on the front of albums at this point in time so in order to make a statement about that the u.s version of the 12 inch that came out had the barcode like huge on it it was just oh, like overly plastered and you could like peel it away to see the album art because that's cool they made it a statement right yeah. because they felt it was like an orwellian you know yeah, thing yeah. against being able to have just a to like immediately market a piece of art just immediately yeah. like market as something like uh to consume yeah um that's really cool 
So they do go a lot more um, electronic. Henry and then, Rollins loves that band, that album too. Uh, Henry Rollins that's is the, so the only time <laughs> that uh, Duty, you know, now for the future is on CD. The only time it was released on CD was like in 1995, and Henry Rollins was the one that put it out because he loves that album. Nice, that's really cool. So in 1980, Freedom of Choice uh, came out, and this is how most people know Devo. The hits. This is the hits. This is Devo's commercial peak, uh, kind of their peak as a band, sadly. Um, uh, so this this record does have some really good stuff, like Girl You Want. And, Girl You Want um, is so good. Girl, it's a great song. Girl You Want is really good. It is a hit. It's like a it's a bop. It's like yeah, yeah, kind of pre cheesy eighties. Yeah. Um, it's before all this like commercial like synth stuff came out, and it's just like a really good song. Um, but the song everyone knows, Whip It. Uh, was on this record, and that single was on the top 40 charts for a very long time and eventually caused it to go platinum. Um, so this is their only, like, platinum high-charting record. It peaked um, at 22 on pop albums in oh, the wow. U.S. Yeah. And the song Whip It itself, I think, peaked at 8. Yeah, it was pretty It was pretty high up the there. Chart. Yeah. Um, and so after this, like, Warner is like, okay, well, you guys can, like, go on a world tour. And, um... <laughs> and here comes the hats. Yeah, so... The energy dome. They went to, um, like, Australia, Europe, all of these things. And this is a time when their kind of, like, personas and fake bands, uh, kind of, I guess, came to light, or maybe it's just, like, a kind of a peak for that time, but, uh, so they did this thing called Dove. Dove. An anagram. Right, yeah, of, of Devo. Devo. And so they would open for themselves as the fake band Dove, dressed differently and played different music, and they pretended to be a Christian soft rock band <laughs> called Dove, the Band of Love. And they opened for themselves. Um, and the reason they did this, uh, which Todd can like elaborate on more than I can, but um, they were really into this parody church called the Church of the Subgenius. Um, and that's, uh, I guess that's why they came up with Dove. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so the Church of the Subgenius is like a parody religion, and it pokes fun at all these other major faiths um and it takes things from them and literally flips them on their head and like the most important thing in the world is slack you know and they don't really elaborate on what that is but they kind of you know basically they don't watch you know there's a whole bunch of rules you know you're not supposed to consume blah blah, blah. but it's like it's it's a joke it's essentially a really big joke and mark mother's is associated with with the church as well as other um, eccentric artists such as R.F. Crumb and David Byrne and you know just a ton of it's like the new wave religion yeah. um, it's a it's a big elaborate joke but at the same time it's kind of serious uh, it's it's pretty funny yeah so they actually had um, seven different fake bands um, and some of these were just in videos and some were like live performances, um, but I think Dove is like their most popular one. Um, I thought that was crazy, like the first time I heard yeah, that. Yeah, it was, was a like, totally so different aesthetic to, like... too. And this, it's like super important to realize that from from their very beginnings, they were a performance piece, right? Their very first showings were performances, um, and so when they became mega hit stars you know with whip it they expanded on the idea and had warner brothers money yeah <laughs> to put on those craziest stage performances. yeah it just got it just got bigger and bigger right um they did a lot of funny stuff on that on that tour for sure um and yeah, that's where the the energy caps come from. The most like iconic yeah. Devo symbol of all time. I was looking at those on Amazon the other day. I was energy like, can caps. I get a can I get a Devo hat? And they're like eighty dollars. So they're like really hard to find. But yeah, 
Maybe uh, there's one out there. So yeah, and that's like in the Whip It music video. That's like their most popular like, helped, video. It helped support um, MTV. Yeah, I mean it MTV literally. Videos. Yeah, it literally was like the mo- like the first highly circulated video on MTV. So like all of America is seeing Whip It, um, which is crazy because this song is it's almost tongue in cheek so much that everyone missed the whole point like um, everything else everyone Diva missed did. the whole point and that's why it got popular is because they missed the point yeah. um well so it, it can be it can be the, like the video at, does not help its no, case no right but um so apparently yeah. when mark mothersbaugh was writing the lyrics to this song he was reading thomas pension like gravity's rainbow um, and that book, he just talks a lot where he's, like, making fun of all, like, the American, like, capitalist, like, cliches, like, you're important, like, you can get through the day, and, like, stupid stuff like that. It was supposed to be, like, he, the purpose of writing it was a, a joke, like, rally song for Jimmy Carter when he was president. Yeah, yeah. It's, like, a, this song with a bunch of cliches in it that to them are like making fun of in itself and i think people just thought it was like a fun party song which it is though it's it is not, a great not fun that. party yeah. song it, it is. is a great fun song and it, it's it is a pop song like it like charted like all these things but it also is like based on this weird thomas pension novel so i don't know that's kind of the duality of like uh like, you know, they say, like, 50% of art is, like, how the person interprets it, but it's, like, with Debo, there's a lot you of don't ways get to it. go. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people just didn't get, it. Just didn't and, get it, and that's why I think a lot of people also didn't even like Devo, even, uh, like, as far as mainstream, like, beyond Whip It, like, people didn't get Devo, so they didn't like it. Like, I, you know, before I, like, understood, like, their first album, I didn't get it. Um, Yo, and, like, on this album, there are a lot of songs that are still very smart right yeah I mean, like gates of steels it's a banger oh yeah it's a banger and it is uh you know i mean it talks about you know the human condition basically. yeah like it's, freedom of choice it's like it's like you know like a take on like religion and like uh you know free will and all these things so it's like yeah they're always um D- I feel like Devo just can't be separated from that way of thinking. It's always very much rooted in de-evolution and, like, society just de-evolving, like, as humans, um, uh, which is crazy. Like, that's the craziest thing about music is Devo may not be super accessible, but they are, like, long-lasting. Like, you listen to this, and it makes sense today. It will continue to um, And it unfortunately yeah. will. Um, but it also, it almost makes more sense. Like, I feel like... It, you know, especially them, like, with MTV, uh, that that being an example of them, like, existing digitally, like, as artists, uh, kind of moving into this new, like, space and culture. Which they had um, made fun of their entire careers. Exactly. They, yeah, it's like now we're even deeper in that. Uh, so when you listen to it, you can apply, like, newer knowledge to that, and it kind of, it's like post-apocalyptic almost. It's kind of crazy. It's so, it's so deep right how far that they are willing to go with with some of these things and you know it takes them commenting on it or you know their very rabid fan base uh to debunk some of the things right i mean there are things that still don't really make sense to people about some of their art like why is the potato so prevalent I mean, like, there's so many, to- so many times they mention potatoes, like the, the song Couch Potato, um, in the song Smart Patrol, you know, he's like, I'm just like a potato, I'm just a spud boy looking for yeah, a real spud tomato. Yeah, spud boy, that's it, yeah, yeah, so they have, like, this thing, and it's, like, in some of their live performances, that's, like, supposedly a character and stuff, um, so yeah, there's a lot of really random references that almost feel like an inside joke or something, yeah, but it's like, what sure. do they mean, like... Um, I have I have a theory on the potato. So, on the cover of Oh No It's Devo, they're all potatoes with their face on it, right? Um, there's in the song, I mean, there's a song Couch Potato. I am a potato. Um, yeah, the words in in Smart Patrol, right? So my theory is that the potato is like a symbol for the amorphous 
blobs that we are devolving into. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right. That makes so that's a lot of sense, theory. actually. That's my theory. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I think so, because they also, like, re- uh, it's, it's like with every album that comes out, it's like a further commentary on where American culture or just people are in general in de-evolution. Um, and so that's like their 1982 album. That makes sense. That's pretty interesting. So actually right before that one, they put out ni- uh, New Traditionalist in 1981. So much. And to me, this is like their last really good album besides the demo state. This is probably later. my second favorite album that I put out, honestly. This is a really good one. It's probably my um, favorite. Through Being Cool is like just a great like way to start off an album, I think. And that's also, I don't know, it's like every song is like just kind of a jab at like the people that they're trying to sell their music to. Oh, um, this this record in and particular. And the whole record is like that. Yeah, right. like soft things, like all you want is soft things. Like um, they're, they're like, hey, better. like, yeah, like we want you to buy our music, but we're like making fun of you uh, and your consumerism the whole time. That's the whole point of um, it. Like they knew after yeah. they got huge with Whip It that they were going to bring on all these people that were going to listen to their music that didn't care about what they were saying and that weren't weren't looking for smart and they wouldn't care about yeah, what, the what they were, were trying to do. Yeah. And so they intentionally made this album dark. They intentionally made this album focus on serious things. This is the only album they have that has like direct political commentary. It's not obscure. They, yeah. they get serious on this album. And I think Through Being Cool is written about the fans. Yeah, exactly. Liked, it's about like that, the people that yeah. liked Whip It, um, which is, you know, it's ironic and it's not, but it's also 1981 when like mainstream punk is like really, you know, yeah. really big in the underground music scene. So it's kind of cool that they did kind of latch onto that like outright, like, um, they just didn't care on this album. They were like, we're going to say what we want to say. Um, and it's also an album of, like, a lot of bands in their career, after they hit, like, a peak, they have to grapple with the fame and, like, the change of lifestyle. And that's what this album touches on, too, um, which is a little bit why it's, like, a little darker. Because they're, like, they went from being, like, college students wearing weird hats to being on a world tour and having, once again, Warner Brothers money. And, like, yeah. uh, it was kind of crazy for and them. And a bunch of people that, you know, just knew them from their Smash video hit. Um, and, you know, if you make music, if you write music, I'm sure. I mean, I have not written a Smash hit. Yeah. You know, I've not written a Smash yeah. hit single <laughs> yet, you know. So I don't know what that's like, but... I am aware that there are very many artists that choose not to play those hits on purpose. Oh, yeah. Um, You know, I'm from Alabama. I don't want to hear Sweet Home Alabama ever. I feel that. Like, Wagon Wheel and all those things. (laughs) Now, if I'm, like, you know, homesick or something, maybe. But that song was, like, the... Sweet, you know, Sweet Home Alabama is on our Dagum state signs now. Yeah. It's, you know, <laughs> it was something that was drilled into you forever and ever and ever. And, you know, that's something that they were trying to overcome. They, when you get to that level, what, what do you do next? Everything is compared to that. And exactly. So- um, and that's actually, um, there's this video, um, that Mark Mothersbaugh narrated and someone illustrated. And so it talks about, um, well, I guess, yeah, we'll go back for a second. It talks about when he was a kid, he was legally blind, and no one knew that until, like, second grade. And oh, wow. so, yeah, he was, like, in second grade, and uh, he finally got glasses, and he could see. And so he started drawing, and his teacher was like, I've never seen someone draw so detailed. And he was like, because I never saw until, like, a week ago, and now I want to draw everything, you know, all the details I see. Um, so basically, later that year, he saw the Beatles on TV, and they had a dream that he was a rock star, and he's like, I have to be an artist. Um, but he said when he was playing music that he um, he felt like music was, like, invented just to torture him. Like, he, like, couldn't grapple it until he really understood art first. So anyway, that's cool. He, so that relates back to later in this video. He talks about after Whip It, they fly home, and um, they ask Warner Brothers like, "What are we supposed to do?" And the person on the phone was like, 
I don't know, just make it as good as Whip It. Like, whatever you do, just make it as good as Whip It. And they were like, he was like, I never thought art was, like, supposed to be just, like, replicating, like, commercial success. Like, that yeah. didn't feel right to me. Um, so they made this and kind of sacrificed their commercial success and lost fans. But as far as their cult following, I don't know, like, people like us, uh, I'm sure a lot of people that were around for this album still listen to it. It's it's great. Um, and, like, probably the best music video they've ever made is from this album. And it's... So every song on this album is so dark. Like, the, the, the concepts behind them are all really dark. But there's this one song that doesn't feel that way in the beginning. And even the title would think, make you think differently. Um, beautiful world right so it talks you know the lyrics are you know it's a wonderful world uh you know they talk about all these awesome things uh that we deal with and the second half of it takes a pretty harsh turn about basically saying yeah it's a wonderful world for some people yeah but not all of us yeah um and the video is 100 percent a, a a masterpiece it really is it's probably the best visual thing they ever did in my opinion and like jerry and mark they direct all the videos that they did you know i mean it's this is a whole thing it's not just the music it's not just the art it's one whole thing right and beautiful world is absolutely incredible i highly suggest you go find it um the first just like a brief synopsis Boogie Boy's in it, and he's watching some film and sees all these great things in the world, and then those great things turn to the worst things that you can imagine that happen in the world. Um, and it's it's like just it's really powerful. Uh, I don't know. It's probably, in my opinion, the best like visual thing that they've done. Yeah, That's I think great. yeah they also kind of uh, matured a lot as visual artists. So they uh, obviously were art students back in the day, and like were doing all kinds of mediums like painting and video work and stuff. Um, and this is really them like I, I don't know, just like directorially and all of these things, uh, really like matured. I think. Uh, yeah, as far this as album sound gets a and lot of vision. slack, but it's great. It, it is a great album. I think uh, this is one you have to dig into. And, like, I, I don't know. It's not that hard, though. Like, I think the first time we listened to it, I was like, oh, wow. Like, yeah. I was taken so aback. Not, not even just um, thematically is this album darker, but it sounds murky, right? Yeah, exactly. It, it, it has uh, a lot of, like, overlay, like, uh, of all these, like, digitized sounds. And it's... Um, a lot of like distortion and this is where I think you can see like a definite uh, like uh, like line of industrialism coming through their music um, so interesting yeah. fact this is why it kind of or part of the reason why it sounds the, the recordings sound very dark very murky um, so they were recording this album on a new version of 2 inch tape when they were recording it and like 3M had just put this out and they were some of the first people to use it. But when they started recording the vocals, the edges of the tape were like disintegrating already. So the sound sounded weird. It didn't make, you know, it wasn't good. Yeah. Uh, and they went to Warner Brothers and they were like, hey, can we just redo this whole thing? And they were like, no, uh, fix it. Uh, so wow. they basically went back in and recorded all the vocals digitally and then like digitally touched everything to to, to press okay. it together instead of huh. it being all on tape yeah that's a good one i think if you're gonna listen to devo you should definitely listen to their very first album i don't know i i don't i couldn't give like a definite what I albums say, you should listen to i say first five are essential yeah right? um Cute, you know are we not men um duty now is great honestly freedom of choice it's yeah. got the bangers on it i mean yeah it, but it's if you want to like good songs yeah too. it does it does uh yeah. that that's like a good that's one of those where like each track is good individually but as an album like it's just that's how i feel with diva like all these albums i like i want to actually sit down and listen to the whole album yeah, like, yeah. as a piece and i'm not one of those people that's like you have to listen to album only like i don't believe in shuffle da, 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 but like Devo's one were like like I said like the first time I heard Are We Not Men like it was on vinyl and that made all the difference yeah, it because does. Track um, I could really just track like the progression of sound throughout the album and uh, 
it's kind of like that in every aspect of the album to listen to these. So yeah, I would definitely give this one a listen if you're trying to like get into Devo, because that's like definitely a um, side of Devo. It's unique. That's good. That is, yeah, yeah, it's unique in their career and just for music at the time, because it's still only 1981, and they're so far ahead of their time that, you know, they're like doing all these cool tech things with their music. So around this time, they aren't charting, Warner Brothers is mad, but uh, they kind of get following from other like cool bands. So Nirvana did a cover of Turnaround, which is like a deep cut of Devo, and it's like such a great cover. He did it on a, Kurt Cobain did it on a John Peel session, um, oh, which wow. you can okay. find, yeah, like on YouTube or something. Um, and to me, those are always kind of my favorite things to find, like a live like studio recording of something um because it's just so raw and like grungy but it's like a devo song and he like sings it um it's really interesting you should listen to it and then Soundgarden and super chunk both cover girl you want off of freedom of choice uh like in their live shows and things um and i really like super chunk so i think that's super cool that they were like influenced by devo enough to do a cover so many people um, right have yeah have been influenced by this band and that's the cool thing yeah so here you really do see like i said industrialism and then new wave is coming about and is a thing and you have like talking heads yeah and like all these full bands. on synth full pop on new wave. new wave yeah um and devo was like the pioneers of like these two different genres so you have people like Lou Reed making industrial then you have Devo industrial and then you have like new wave and Devo is literally like I can't think of a better band to yeah Yeah. there's like maybe five bands that like really kick-started that and that's Devo yeah I think that's super cool the next album is it's cool it's interesting like this is probably new tradition is probably my second favorite right but oh no it's Devo is really interesting this uh, is an interesting album. So Shout, this is, Oh No It's Evil came out in 1982. Shout came out in 1984. I really don't like Shout. Shout's terrible. It's terrible. But Oh No It's Evil is a really interesting album. So I listened to this one yesterday. They got a lot um, of flack for this album. A lot of people were not happy because there's a lot of really... Risque obs- kind yeah, of yeah, some, uh, some, observations. Uh, some, uh, I would say, macabre uh, yeah. like approaches. Uh, so... They got in a lot of trouble because one of the songs on here, I Desire, is a poem that was written by John Hinckley Jr. And John Hinckley Jr. is the guy that tried to assassinate Reagan. Uh, And he wrote this poem to Jodie Foster. Uh, The reason why he tried to assassinate Reagan was because he was in love with Jodie Foster. And he thought that she would, you know, appreciate it. Yeah. So they took that poem and turned it into the song I Desire. And it's not particularly a great song by any means. It's okay. Um, But it's, they got a lot of mess for that. Um, And he, this also big mess was from some, some kind of sketchy things too, like, this lady was writing letters to a, a radio DJ at the time, and she was probably schizophrenic. Um, and there were all of those letters are like really kind of weird and out there. And uh, Mother Spa kind of took them and turned them into lyrics for Big Mess. But Big, Big Mess is a great song. Big Mess is a good song. Um, I like Big Mess and like Time Out for Fun. Time Out and, for Fun, so um, good. And, and yo, explosions, so, explosions is really good on this one. In particular. Like, the last probably minute and a half of Explosions, like, if you listen to that, then you can hear an insanely, like, obvious, it has to be a huge influence to, like, Santa Gold, right? So, oh, wow. the last, cool. like, minute and a half yeah. of sounds like Santa Gold music, That's cool. which is another connection to them anyway, right? Like, Santa Gold produced their last album. Yeah. That's the cool thing about Devo, people that were influenced by them, like, in turn worked with them, um, which is kind of what started from the beginning with David Bowie and things like that. So, oh no, it's Devo. Um, Probably so, the last good one. Yeah, this is around <laughs> the time when they get dropped from their record label because they're putting out 
these like super weird albums that people either don't get or don't like or maybe they aren't good. It wasn't I don't as know. good as Whip It, right? Um, this... Right, exactly. It's not as commercially successful as Whip It, so they can't make money off of Devo anymore. And also, there's tension in the band around this time. Like, so... yeah, shout shout is easily the worst thing that they have ever done. Oh uh, yeah, um, so 1984 is shout, and this album. It's I don't awful. know how to describe it other than it sounds like they're trying to make like 80s pop music and it's not even good for bad 80s pop commercial top 40 music. Yeah, so they it used sucks. they used it's a, a specific synth for this, right? Yeah. And it's like a a sampling synthesizer and they used it for this one and the next album and it sounds kind of like someone's shooting laser beams in a tin room. Like yeah, it's, it's very it's yeah, very not, tinny. It's very um, it's just not good. It it's uh, this it, album is bad. I, I was mean, listening to it today, and it just I don't know. Pu- I like Puppet Boy. Um, if I'm gonna like any of the songs on this album, I kind of like Puppet Boy because it's kind of an ode to their old stuff, like Get Up, Puppet Boy, like to know you're like a yeah. puppet to the government, but it's almost outright like obviously like anti-government so it's like not as cool as even the cover on this album is not good and like that's something that they were always really good at yeah this is the first cover where they don't use the uh red green yellow and blue devo uh so that yeah that's like interesting they move towards this like digital font and have this weird pop art gradient thing I don't know. It's very not Devo. It's very much like their last attempt to be commercially successful. And I almost feel bad because it's like at that point they're not making the music. Yeah, no. Uh, Jerry, has, Jerry said on Twitter, like somebody asked him a question on Twitter about Shout, and his response was, it's too painful to talk about. Yeah, um, I can't imagine. It's awful. It is awful. It's not Mark Mothersbaugh says it's the biggest regret of his professional career. <laughs> it is terrible. Um... So thankfully they have other things to redeem themselves, but this yeah. one is uh, pretty bad. The next one is oh, better, but it's still bad. Yeah. Um, so after that, they put out... Um, Total Devo? Yeah, it was Total Devo and then um, Total Smooth Devo. Noodle Maps. Uh, so yeah, that's so like 89 and 90. Yeah, 89 and 90. 88 and 90. Um, and Total Devo's okay. Um, Smooth Noodle Maps is interesting. Weird. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a weird album. Um, and it's kind of uh, tongue in cheek once again that this is kind of the de evolution of the band. Yeah, like is it, here, they became their own joke. They exactly, it's like a self fulfilling prophecy. Um, so those two albums, you see a breakdown, and then they kind of break up. Uh, like. You know, they're still kind of making music, but they're not Devo anymore. They're not performing. People drop out of the band. So in 90 and 91, they decided to release Hardcore Volume 1 and 2. So these records are demos that they recorded during 1974 to 77, which is even before their first album. Um, in their basement on a four-track recorder uh, while they were in college, or just out of college. And these records are really insane. It, like, kind of explains Devo because it's so primal. It's, like, so broken down and, like, DIY and primal sounding um, as compared to their first album, but it kind of, like, uh, Mongoloid and Jocko Homo, which ended up being their first single, were first appeared here. Yeah, a bunch of the, like, early versions of songs are here. Um, it, it varied, you know, like, they changed, and that's not something they just did from the demos, like, they rewrote songs several times, and they'll appear and sound different depending on where they show up, like, if it's on the on a video or on you know um somebody's uh movie or you know a b-side or whatever it would be a different version of the song volume one in particular has a lot of really if you are into the weird and you are into it's like avant-garde almost like super uh, avant-garde um and it's uh it's very I don't know, it's kind of spacey, it's primal, so it's like, 
it's very much when they had this like elect like homemade electronic drum kit and like they're using guitars in their basement and stuff so it's really a mix of like the digital sound and like rock uh, of the time and um, I don't know I feel like releasing these is kind of like a redemption for Devo when they they put out all these oh, records yeah. and then it's like let's go back to the very beginning and do like Devo 101 um, yeah, so I think that's, like, rec I would also say that's, like, really, I would recommend listening to those demos, Hardcore Volume 1 and 2, um, because it predates, like, their first record deal, it predates Devo itself, um, and it still is, like, really great to listen to. This is kind of like a, um... If you, no, so check it out. Just, if, I don't know, if you're, you, if you have a long drive or something, If you're I into the weirder versions yeah. of Tom Waits... Then you okay, will that's love a good way to describe it. Yeah, hardcore volume one. <laughs> yeah, because it is very, like you know, butcher Tom Waits, right? It's not songs; it's noises and statements, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah, it's, it's cool. very disjointed. Um, and but it is cool that way. It's very much like yeah. it's weird sonically. It's good though. It's good. Devo after this really only releases one more like studio record. And that is after they broke up for a very long time, and in 2010 released something for everybody. It's good. Yeah. It's good. It's, it's good it's very for like listenable. a. So it's very much like a legacy band reuniting to do one last record. But there are bands that do that well, like the Breeders just put out that record, and it's honestly like really it. good. But some legacy Descendants. bands, yeah, uh, yeah. But some legacy bands come back together and try to like do a record. It's not that good. So I think Devo did okay. Um, and now they're playing stuff, like, they're playing something in, like, Long Island or New York, uh, this summer, Bob and it's died. not, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, so not every member is alive, so both, uh, Bob Casali and Alan Myers died in the 2000s, and obviously they're a lot older, but Mark Mothersbaugh is the one that's Mark definitely, and Jerry yeah, are still there, still up to stuff, and he does like soundtracks now. So he did like the Rugrats soundtrack, and that's he... like my first connection to this band. Is yeah, Rugrats. I was thinking about that. I was like, that's crazy. Like I was watching that as a kid. Um, that's kind of interesting. That could be a podcast in itself because the other day I was also watching Little Miss Sunshine that I probably haven't watched since like third or fourth grade and Sufjan Stevens is in it and I was like, that's why I love Sufjan Stevens because I always love this movie. Um, anyway, so Devo, if you like the Rugrats soundtrack, you'll probably like Devo. Yeah. Um, but he also was in like a lot of Wes Anderson movies. He did music, like scores specifically for that, like the Royal Tenenbaums and the Life Aquatic. The Royal Tenenbaums, like one of my favorite movies. Very ever. ambient. Yeah, scene, yeah. Scene and I, it's like I didn't even notice music. he did it um, until I read about it. And then now he does stuff like the Lego Movie and uh, a lot of other kids' movies. And I think it's fitting. I yeah, think it's so uh, interesting. Disney put out a whole like series of videos called Devo 2.0. Oh yeah, I forgot which was, about Devo. Which 2.0. Which, 2 which yeah. was just little kids, like, lip syncing and dancing to Devo songs. my first example of Devo, because I actually remember, I wasn't, I didn't get ever get, like, Kids Bop CDs, but I got the, like, Disney, like, hit CDs every yeah, year. Yeah, Disney Radio. Di yeah, Disney Radio, like, Disney Mania 1 through 4 or whatever, and they had, uh... I can't remember what song it was by Devo 2.0 on there. I really... I need to look that up. Um, and I remember, like, yeah, watching the Disney videos on Disney Channel of, like, the yeah, kids, man. like, just recorded dressed Devo like songs. Devo. And I was like, is this what Devo is? Like, I thought it was an old band. Like, I saw it on this music video, and it was weird. Um, I think that's cool now that I think about it, man, though, that this... they were, like, indoctrinating kids with Devo. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they had to change some lyrics, obviously. Oh, yeah. But, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that's cool, though. I Yeah, I totally forgot about Devo 2.0. That's Devo crazy. Devo 2.0. There's a bunch of like, stuff it, like that's that. That's one of those things. I like forget was reality like yeah. you know, a lot of the early 2000s I'm like that really happened man this band so they even put out a video a, a video game right Devo it's called uh oh yeah that's right it's named after the Smart Patrol song on uh Duty Now so it's like an early CD-ROM video game oh wow where it's like Basically, you, you remember early computer, like Windows 1995, uh, Where in the World is Sa Carmen Sandiego Yeah, you had, like, style. put the CD in, it took 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, you know, it's basically you're reading a story and you have yeah. a couple of choices. Yeah. Um, and that's essentially what this game is. 
Uh, but they, it's, it's way ahead of its time. It's not necessarily good, uh, but it's a, there are YouTube videos of people playing through it. Uh, and I suggest checking it out because yeah, it's weird. That's cool. Um, um yeah. And everything. so, yeah, they did the this. soundtrack for that one, obviously, since it's yeah. their video game. And then Mark Mothersbaugh has done soundtracks for a lot of other video games. So, yeah, everything. that's, um... That's Devo, I guess. Um, is there anything I guess we forgot? I feel like we covered most everything. So their um, reunion. That's yeah. How yeah, this their happened reunion. is cool. They did that. So they went to the South by Southwest like interactive fest, right? And Jerry and uh, Mark were there, and they are sitting there, and they basically said that they have. This was their first album back with Warner Brothers, in 2010, and. They basically said that they're going to do this, like, the legit marketing way, that they hired this marketing company, and that there's they put together this internet startup called Devo Inc., and, like, presented at South by Southwest, they presented this business meeting to show, like, their business plan, and they put on this PowerPoint, and it was, like, had Venn diagrams with, like buzzwords and crap and it was just uh, again a huge very, parody of yeah it very itself. much devo and they had like a, a real record exec you know talk and like they used a bunch of lyrics from previous devo songs and like for that album also they did they do a lot of stuff with their fan club like a lot of stuff with their fan club and they did a song study for that album so there's a couple of different versions of there's uh something for everyone and one of them was they put up 16 songs they sent 16 songs to their fan uh club and they basically told their fan club to vote on 12 of them to be on the album interesting um, like crowdsourcing their yeah album. they crowdsourced that and uh it's a diff- little different version than one of yeah. them that was released it, i think the deluxe version has like 15 songs or something but that's they cool. did a lot of stuff like that with their fan club. Yeah, so that just kind of goes to show like they're a cult band because they've had a cult following even up to their reunion, even after they put out all those albums. Um, but yeah, that's Still I guess that's active. pretty much everything on Devo. And um, yeah, you should give them a listen. Anyway. Everything <laughs> on Devo. Absolutely. Everything. It hits it all. You should even listen to Shout. Just so you know, you can't enjoy Are We Not Men if you haven't heard Shout. So, yeah, you, know, that's very you gotta true. have the good with the bad. Um, yeah, so thank you for listening.